me tell you, there's always a problem. That's Jerry Weinberg's first law of consulting, and I have some bad news uh, to tell you. You guys have a problem. We all have a problem as software developers. We can't build the future in which we want to live fast enough. Now, that's a great problem. We're in demand, but it is <coughs> a problem. Is functional programming a solution to that problem? Well, some people say it is. It has a firm foundation in mathematical theory. Um, it attracts curious and engaged programmers, and curious and engaged programmers tend to be better programmers. And you hear claims about the productivity of functional programming and functional programming languages. So does F-sharp solve that problem of building the future as fast as we can envision it? Well, no. I don't believe in silver bullets. And F-sharp isn't a silver bullet. But sometimes functional techniques and certain language features can help you solve problems in a half or a third or a quarter of the time, and code, lines of code, that you get with other techniques. Not every problem, not all the time, but sometimes. To me, what's a little more common when I sit down with F-sharp is that I can be a little more confident about a starting point. I can rely on uh, tackling the problem uh, with what's on my screen without having to think about lots of other extraneous things. And sitting down with courage to face a problem, for me, is a big part of the productivity going forward. Ultimately, my guess is that with F-sharp, over month in, month out, you might gain around 20% productivity. So, you know, that's no silver bullet, but it is like getting an extra Friday every week for free. So maybe F-sharp can give you an extra Friday every week. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, how many people here in the room consider themselves functional programmers? Oh, okay, so a couple, enough to intimidate me. Uh, not, but not too many of you, but, but I'm a little confused. How many people here have used language integrated query? Oh, well, okay. Um, how many people here have used model view view model? Oh, right, where you have data transfer objects that reach into your domain objects, read immutable data, but not all of the data in the objects and don't have state? You do that? Yeah, okay. Um, so now, well, I'm not even gonna ask this because we all unit test, right? Um, well, I'm, I'm fundamentally lazy, and, uh, and, and, and lazy is a keyword in F-sharp, so that speaks to me. Um, <laughs> And when I started unit testing, I spent a lot of time in my setup functions, and then I'd write a test, and I'd probe the, I'd call the method that I was uh, interested in testing, and then I would write some more code to sort of probe the state. But being lazy, over the years, I've found that I've just moved towards, you know what, it's just easier to program these methods so that they sort of take all of the parameters, all of the context they need, to perform their calculation, and instead of storing it away so that I just have to look at it with my test code, I'm just gonna return that value. Um, does that, has anyone had that experience too? So, these are all functional techniques. Functional techniques are much more <laughs> common in the mainstream than are generally given credit for, and a lot of us are closer to being functional programmers than we realize. You know, you may be a functional programmer if you've used data transfer objects. You may be a functional programmer if you've used language integrated query. You may be a functional programmer uh, if it's changed the way you design your objects. Before we go any further, I, I have to get something off my chest. Uh, I'm incompetent. <laughs> I, I don't work on the F-sharp language or F-sharp support at Xamarin. 
Uh, it's just a language I like. And my code is not idiomatic, it's just the code I wrote. So I was trying to come up with a visual metaphor for that. And so this is my F-sharp code. It might look okay at first. <laughs> so having said that, before joining Xamarin, I, was, uh, I worked at a company that had made a strategic decision to shift towards functional programming, and I was in charge of a module of uh, about 20,000 lines of Scala code, Scala being a functional language that's available on the JVM, and uh, this was integrated into a very large code base on the proverbial mm -hmm. mission-critical application in a high-pressure environment. So I de developed a lot of very strong opinions, and in addition to showing some code, if it's okay, I'd like to share some of those opinions that I developed during that time. It was a team that was moving from an object-oriented world to a hybrid functional object world. F-sharp is a hybrid language which allows you to combine object-oriented and functional programs. So our first program is extremely simple. It's a Hello World application on iOS. You can use F-sharp to program iOS, Xamarin Android, and uh, Xamarin Forms. Now, a bit of an asterisk on the Xamarin Forms, but it can be done. Uh, it's just not, not officially separated, uh, not officially supported yet. So, so, so let's look at some code. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, code? Uh, Shouldn't that come later? I mean, shouldn't we talk about, you know, monad combinators, Cleasley arrows, uh, you know, category theory? I mean, I mean, these are the basics of functional programming. Well, no, we're not going to talk about monad combinators and uh, Cleasley arrows. I think it is valid in an academic setting, if you maybe start with that, if you have a couple years to devote to the basics of programming, it gives you a very firm foundation. But if functional programming is to succeed in the mainstream, and if F-sharp is to succeed in the mainstream, it has to succeed by working with legacy code bases, and it has to be productive for smart, but skeptical and busy professionals. Now look, I promised you an extra Friday every week, and we're willing to put in some time to get there, but there has to be a payoff. And ideally, that payoff would result not only in us learning F-sharp uh, and being able to work on F-sharp uh, projects, but wouldn't it be great if learning F-sharp, learning functional techniques, improved our C-sharp code? And I think it does. So let's look at some code. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have to cue you by hitting the demo. <laughs> so can we switch to... Yep. Okay, here we have F-sharp on the left and C-sharp on the right. Um, split editor view in Xamarin Studio, well, that's a nice feature. And we can see that on a line-by-line -line basis, the F-sharp code looks very different, right? It's not from the C language of programming. But let's look at the structure of these two programs. You can see that both in the C-sharp world and the F-sharp world, we have to declare a number of types. Well, we have to have a UI view that defines our user interface. We have a simple controller derived from UI view controller. That's in charge of the user experience. And we have to define an app delegate, which handles the application lifecycle. Now let's take a look even at the finished launching override inside our app delegate. And again, line by line, nearly identical code. So, one thing to notice, though, is that the F-sharp code is incrementally smaller than the C-sharp code. It turns out that this is uh, 42 lines of F-sharp code. I had to tweak something to make it come out to exactly 42, but I did that. 
and it's 52 lines of C sharp code. So if, like me, you write 10 lines of code per day, there's your Friday right there. <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, but the thing to notice, again, is that structurally, nearly identical. Yesterday, John Skeet talked about those dependencies between the runtime, the base class library, and the languages, and how they all interact. The structure of the technology stack you're using, all the way up to your libraries and code bases, shapes the form of your solution. The code is near identical, but there are some differences. I declare classes on the C-sharp side, and on the F-sharp side, I use record types. And there are some, some semantic differences between those. But structurally, very similar. So uh, Larry, I, I think I can see a way here to make this just a little bit more functional. That sounds great. Joel Martinez, by the way, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for helping me out. Of course, uh, of take course. it away. Uh, yeah, so uh, the first thing I notice here is that we have this member, uh, member value uh, with a getter and setter where we're going to store uh, the UI window, right? And we have to have a member value because otherwise uh, it'll get garbage collected, right? So this is sort of a, uh, a thing that we have to deal with from the object-oriented world. But, you know, one simple change that we can make is that we can take this and instead of initializing it on uh, the finish launching method, we can just initialize it right there where we declare it, and we're not going to be resetting that anywhere, so we just change that to a getter. And at that point, we have a nice immutable member, uh, which you know we can be sh sure that won't change later. Uh, that's great, and I do think that maybe this is the right way to uh, initialize your your window variable. Um, and this technique that we just saw, now this was a trivial refactoring, but this technique of starting with an object-oriented approach, starting with the approach with which you're most familiar, and then refactoring towards a more functional approach is very common and, in my experience, very successful. Most of the books you read on functional programming uh, want to start with Hello World. Well, actually, Hello World comes in Chapter 7 of most <laughs> functional programming books. but they want to start with just the very basics and build you up. But again, as I said, real world, large code bases, and it's much more successful to start with what you know and refactor towards. Why do I say that this is important and common? Well, it's because the iOS and Android SDKs are fundamentally object oriented. Uh, back to the slides, please. There's this unfortunate mentality that's out there that divides the world into two tribes, the object-oriented tribe and the functional tribe. And this mentality gives rise to a vicious lie, which is that you have to defect from the object-oriented world to gain the benefits of the functional world. This is uh, a false choice, but you can see it's played out even, even last night we had this horrible, <laughs> horrible situation. As I said, the iOS and Android SDKs are fundamentally object-oriented, and there's a lot of object-oriented code in the world, and you have to learn to move fluidly between these two paradigms, the functional paradigm and the object-oriented paradigm. And they aren't two opposing tribes, they're peanut butter and chocolate. These are two great paradigms that work great together. Sometimes you hear people say, well, I want to be purely functional. I want to be purely functional. And the thing is, is objects are the lingua franca of the mainstream development community. Not only is there a lot of object-oriented code, a lot of object-oriented SDKs, most of the design and architectural books and artifacts that have been generated over the past 20 years have assumed object terminology. You know, even more than that, objects work. Objects work for communication. Objects work for structuring uh, large code bases. The best phrase that I've heard to help your architectures is functional in the small, objects in the large. 
try to move aggressively towards functional techniques when writing individual methods or even designing the forms of your objects, but then use those familiar object-oriented techniques and communication techniques to work you know, with, with larger modules and applications and services and communicating with clients. So I've been using this phrase, software paradigms, that's something that you hear about in this world. It comes from Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and he defined a paradigm as something which, for a time, provides model problems and solutions for a community of practitioners. And it's the worldview you bring, you bring to the problem. And so, for instance, take a look at this duck. What? It has a... Uh, oh, well. Duck? Uh, that's a rabbit. No, uh, what are you talking about? It, it, it's a duck. It, it, it's got this bill and an eye. Uh, I think it's a mallard. No, no, look, you've got, you've got the ears on the left. You've got the eye in the middle. You've got the nose on the right. I mean, this, this is a rabbit. Oh, that doesn't sound right to me. Uh, how many people here agree with me? This is definitely a duck. Okay, all right, well, does, does, does anyone agree with that this is a... a yes. Oh. Okay, so... I'm going to blow your mind. <laughs> you have to train yourself to see both the duck <laughs> and the rabbit. You have to learn to move fluidly between the paradigms. So for uh, you know something a little more interesting than Hello World, I thought I'd write a Mandelbrot generator. And I said to myself, oh, I'm going I'm to be obnoxiously functional with the code I wrote. So I sat down and I broke it into tiny little functions. And I wrote my Mandelbrot calculation, but I separated that from the code that assigned uh, color to the results. And, uh, oh, I wrote the Mandelbrot calculation itself as a recursive function because I thought that would be obnoxiously wrong-headed. And uh, I wrote about 120 lines of code and I hit the compile button. And not only did it compile, but it ran and the first time it ran, it produced this output. So, maybe it's common for you guys to write 120 <laughs> lines of code and have it run the first time, but I had to step away from my computer <laughs> for several minutes. Um, and, and, and when I finally returned, it probably the next day, to be honest, um, <laughs> When I looked at that code that I wrote that I intended to be obnoxious, well, I'm not really sure that it's all that obnoxious. Let rec. So rec is a keyword. We're defining a recursive function called Mandel. And we declare some of the, and it takes a, you know, some arguments, uh, C and Z, those are complex numbers, and we declare those explicitly. Uh, but again, I'm lazy. We could declare the other arguments and we could declare what type this function returns, but you know, who has time? So <laughs> you guys all know type inference in C sharp, you know, that's nice. You know, I like strong types, I like compile time types, but I actually hate typing, so. <laughs> the body of this code shows something uh, show some F-sharp pattern matching. And again, this is probably not idiomatic. If, you could do this with an if-then statement. In Rachel's talk yesterday, she had this great slide where she showed how powerful and how flexible F-sharp's pattern matching facilities are. Sometimes I'm asked by people if, they're, if, if I know of a secret sauce in functional programming. Hey, where do you get those third of the effort or fourth of the effort uh, speed ups. And in general I say, well, no, it's really more of an incremental thing. But pattern matching is one of those facilities that I think, you know, can significantly reduce the size of your code base and therefore give you a significant uh, productivity benefit. Uh, you know, not, not, not trivial pattern matching like this, but Frank Kruger wrote a DSL 
for compiling iOS auto layout constraints. And he wrote it in F sharp and he used pattern matching and the code's available up on GitHub and it's, it's dense code. Like if you guys were to look at it right now, you'd, it might be a little unfamiliar, but once you get comfortable with the syntax and pattern matching, it, it's very elegant. And I think it's, it, it reads very easily. But what's interesting is that Frank had written the exact same DSL in C sharp. And to be clear, he's an excellent programmer in, in either language. But his C sharp version of this was, I believe, three times as many lines of code. So, th so there's one of those situations where for an excellent programmer, using this language technique, he really got that benefit. You know, he didn't just get an extra Friday, he kicked off work sometime, you know, Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> so, man after my own heart. Um, yeah, you know, and, and we're talking about the, you know, obnoxiousness of this, and you can see that the pattern matching that we're using here is very somewhat similar to the switch statement in C sharp, and you know, we return the int value if we've completed our recursive iterations, or we uh, return how many times we've gone through once our magnitude exceeds the threshold. But then at the bottom, if we look at the recursive function call, well, we see that we pass the C through unchanged, and we pass the threshold through unchanged. I, we decrease B by one because it's just our iteration count. And then it's a question of, well, what does the Z become? Z times Z plus C. Well, that happens to match pretty closely what Benoit Mandelbrot sketched down as the definition of the Mandel function. So let's take a look at some code, I think is the first thing we're gonna look at. Can we switch to, okay. And here, again, not a very sophisticated use of pattern matching, but you can begin to see some features which you can see would be a little different in C sharp. Here I'm defining patterns for the left-hand side of the screen and the right-hand side of the screen, top of the screen, bottom of the screen. And then if you look at this code, where I'm trying to figure out when the person touches the screen, which quadrant they've touched in. And to me, this is pretty clear code, reads pretty easy. And I think that you can see that if you were to do this in C sharp, it would require some nesting. So let's take a look at the functionality. Here it is. And what Joel's gonna do is he's gonna click in the lower left and this will zoom in and zoom in on the lower left quadrant, upper left, performs the calculation, takes a little time, upper right. Okay, so not the greatest Mandelbrot generator you've ever seen. Uh, swipe to zoom out, and then he can repeat the process. And you'll notice that when he repeats the process, we're getting the image very quickly. So I wanted to make my app more awesome, right? This is about making your app more awesome using F Sharp. So I wanted to speed things up. A lot of the times in functional programming, you hear this phrase immutability, and people phrase it as a negative. Well, what does immutability mean? Well, it means that you can't reassign to a variable once it's been assigned. So it sounds negative. But I prefer to think of immutability as reliability if you have a value and you've assigned to it, you can rely on it having the value. And the same goes for functions. Think about the Mandelbrot calculation. Every time you call the Mandelbrot calculation with the same origin and extent, you expect to get the same image back. Let's switch back to the slides. So I wrote this code. I said, well, let's create a dictionary that contains the types of the origin and the scale, and that returns the results of the Mandelbrot calculation. And when this function is called at a particular origin and scale, well, if I've already calculated that, return my previous calculation. If not, do the calculation. And, uh, you know, of course, I have to do the calculation at some point. Do the calculation, put it in the dictionary, and return the result. So, because functions are first class in F-sharp, 
and because the type system can elegantly express function signatures, we can look at code like this, which is associated with the particular arguments that I'm interested in. Uh, you know, the location, the extent, and the image that it returns. But those really don't have anything to do with the logic of the function. So with F sharp, we're able to take domain-specific code like this and generalize it. This is from the excellent book, Expert F sharp. And what it shows is a little different from what I showed, because while I dealt with values, this is actually a function that takes a function and returns a function. But again, you know, you, you guys are used to lambdas and C-sharp. You've seen this sort of stuff before. But maybe a little more verbose. F-sharp makes it very easy to specify that this memoize function takes as its argument a function that goes from T to U. And then the logic, just as we saw on the previous slide, it creates a new dictionary whose keys are the types of the arguments, type T, uh, and that returns the results of the, of the function to which it was, pa uh, which was passed to it, U. And then it returns a function. So this is returning a closure that's capturing uh, the N and the T, or it's capturing the T and the F, actually. And uh, same logic. If the dictionary we've created contains the arguments with which we're called, return the previous calculation. And this is nice generic code. But of course, performance is a common problem. Memoization is a common solution in the functional world. You use memoization techniques a lot. Of course, you have to think about it. You know, memoization is a trade-off between calculation speed and memory. Well, when we talk about common challenges and common solutions in the object-oriented world, we're used to talking about, well, what are the design patterns that we use when we face this common problem? There's this myth that functional programming doesn't have or doesn't need design patterns. And conversely, there's a myth that when functional programmers talk, instead of talking about real problems, they just talk math. It's all, all just math. But how many people here have heard of MapReduce, right? Yeah, sure, it's this entire niche in our industry now. And MapReduce is a functional programming design pattern. Uh, if you're familiar with Link, you could, we could call this select aggregate. Turns out that if you have a very large data set and a very complex calculation, turns out that a common solution is to divide it into a series of sub-calculations, some of which can be applied in parallel across your data set, that's the map, and then you create an intermediate result or reduce the data set or somehow make things a little easier, and usually just a single one doesn't get you the full solution, so it's map, reduce, map, reduce, map, reduce. Well, that's a design pattern. There's another design pattern that's very important in the functional world called bind. And the different languages call it different things. F sharp calls it collect. You may know it from link as select many. Has anyone used select many in link? Okay, sure. Uh, sometimes it's called flat map because in certain contexts it can be construed as uh, opening a container and getting its contents, flattening the inner container, and then mapping across those contents. So you don't have to spend two years learning monads, monoids, and applicatives, but, I'm sorry, and I'm kind of sorry to tell you this, you may find yourself using these words in conversations, not because it's math, but because it's saving you time. These are techniques, these are design patterns that are providing solutions, these are all in service to getting you that extra Friday. Stepping back from design patterns, I want to talk about pipes and filters. It's just more of an idiom than a design pattern in F-sharp. 
we can imagine that if we face the challenge of writing a program that gets the longest word in our dictionary that contains the string purple, uh, given the appropriate API, uh, we could do it this way with lots of temporary variables. Lots of code in this world looks like this. Temporary variables pollute things. Uh, so we might inline our function calls, and we all know that, well, sometimes that looks good, sometimes it doesn't look good, but it can be a little hard to read. As you might have guessed from uh, my API, on the Unix command line, we'd do it this way. We'd just pipe the from one function, uh, from one small program into another. Well, I'm happy to say that F Sharp uses, has pipe operators, and it has both a forward pipe operator and a backward pipe operator. And Rachel really covered this in her talk, so I'm not going to go into it, but you can see that what I'm doing here, this is again from my Mandelbrot uh, program, I start with a list of tuples of integers, and by using the pipe operator, I can take one type of data, pipe it into a function, transform the data, and end up with the result I need. So Larry, uh, I notice that you're using uh, you know, list map several times in a row. Uh, is this really something that's uh, idiomatic? N no, the functional community does tend to favor dense code. And one of the things that I've got called out on in design reviews is that I do tend to break it into steps, which some of my, my, my colleagues who are smarter than me, uh, more competent than me, think are too trivial. Um, so you might do it this way. I think this is kind of a horses for courses. Um, again, I like it. I, I like to keep things easy. A tough thing about the pipeline operator is that the uh, that the F sharp compiler inlines those function codes, and it can be difficult to debug unless you happen to know this handy trick uh, by Aldrich Spetch, in which you simply redefine the piping operator. So instead of being inlined. You redefined it this way. You flip around. You you just explicitly make the calculation, and you can just set a breakpoint on that. Uh, so we talked about memoization. We talked about performance, uh, but memoization strategies have to be adapted to the problem at hand. And we decided to go a different way uh, as far as improving the performance. So we can switch. So now we have a different version of our Mandelbrot program. And Joel can zoom in, uh, maybe not real time, but close to real time. And he can pan. And on my iPad Air, the difference here is it takes about three seconds to calculate a full screen of data versus about 300 milliseconds on uh, using this technique. Now, so can anyone guess what technique we're using to get a, uh, an order of magnitude performance? I think I heard someone say shader, uh, which, which is correct. So let's take a look at the code real quick. I know we have a shader in here somewhere. Yeah, so we, we, a friend of mine wrote a shader program. And you can see, uh, here's the Mandelbrot calculation. Now, this is decidedly non-functional. Uh, it's decidedly non-object oriented. But here's the calculation. You can see its similarities to the calculation I had done earlier. Um, and if we take a very quick look at the code, you can see that essentially we're interacting with the OpenGL API. And can you bring up maybe some OpenGL code? Yeah, so we're interacting with the OpenGL API. And this is a C API. So again, not only can't we really use functional techniques to shorten this code, this code, line by line, would be very similar with your C sharp code. The shape of the SDK and the tools you use help shape the form of your solution. So the shader itself is, a, uh, is, is nothing but a string. And this reminds me of a story. So once upon a time, there were two Mars surveyor, uh, two, two probes going to Mars. Coming out of interplanetary space, one of the probes needed to enter orbit, read the corrections that it had made in interplanetary space from a file calculated its burn, fired its rockets, and crashed straight into Mars. It didn't take them long to discover that the problem, I can stop. oh yeah, I'm sorry, can we go back to the slides? It didn't take them long to find out that the problem is that 
the, the, the values were written in imperial units and they were expecting SI units. This proves an adage of mine, which is that the world is not strongly typed. The world is stringly typed. So I talked to uh, Peter Norvig, who was on the review board about this, and he said that he didn't know of any language, no matter how type strict, that forces you to tag a value with a unit of measure. <laughs> and if we can switch to the demo. Okay, here we have what our code would have looked like before. And I know this talk was on making your apps awesome with uh, making your apps awesome, but this actually shows F -sharp sc scripting. And uh, F -sharp is a great scripting language. And I, I, I wanted to show this. So this is the situation, this is our before slide. We have our X, which has a value of 10, and that's in foot pounds, and we've helpfully written a code comment. So, you know, that's good. And then we have a mutable Y, and that needs, to, that needs to have its value in joules. And we've put in an exclamation point. <laughs> so we've pretty much done everything that could be expected of us. <laughs> and uh, when we run this, we get a result of 10 joules and crash into Mars and have to work weekends, you know, all of which goes against my core values. So, uh, we can do better. F sharp has a facility called units of measure, and it actually defines the SI units of measures and their abbreviations, but we wanted to do it explicitly. It's an attribute which you can apply to a numeric type, and here we're just defining two types of uh, force, F, M, A, uh, uh, force. We're defining foot pounds and joules. And we're annotating our variable x with foot pounds rather than a code comment, even though, you know, I don't know, code comments, everyone reads those, and our y0 with joules. So, okay, and then we're doing our assignment. How does this go for us? So, this is a script, so it looks like this is happening at uh, runtime, but in fact, this is a compile time error. And it's a pretty nice compile time error. This is a lot better than crashing into, into Mars. Um, but, geez, you know, now I have to go through, I have to change all of my foot pounds, all of my foot pound code into joules, you know, as again, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like I'm going to get my extra Friday out of that unless, would it be possible, and the answer, you know, is going to be yes. Uh, would it be possible to write a function to convert foot pounds to joules? This function that we write takes a value annotated with foot pounds and then look at the conversion factor, joules, foot pounds. Since we pass in foot pounds, the numerator and the denominator cancel out, leaving us with joules. And just to make that explicit, here we say our y is, again, it's going to expect a joule so let's take a, you know, and then assign it this, uh, the value of x when the function's applied to it. Ah, and we got the right number of joules. And, and, and we can enter Mars orbit, uh, which is awesome because there are great parties when probes enter orbit. So, uh, which again is really all I care about. Uh, the real problem, I have a note here, was pound four seconds. So if any of you were on the JPL review team, you know, you're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> And I wanted to show that in Xamarin Studio, when you use units of measure, you get, uh, can we go back to the slides? You get full popover help on this. So not only do you get the compile time benefits, you actually, you know, it pops right up exactly what units of measure you're expecting. And the great thing about, or a great thing about units of measure is that these go away at compile time. You get the compile time guards. You get all of the benefits of, uh, you know, a type, of, of a compile time type. But at runtime, you're just using a float. You're getting full native performance with these. So it's the best of all possible worlds. Oh, uh, and here's an asterisk. 
Well, actually, you aren't forced to use units of measure, but I think you should. We've talked about the stringly typed world, and uh, F Sharp has a great facility called Type Providers. Rachel went into it in some extent, uh, so I'm not going to repeat what she said. And instead, I'm just going for our last demo. We're going to take a look at Type Providers, and I'm going to throw over to Joel. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, so a couple weeks ago, Larry asked me to uh, help him out with this talk, uh, and I was like, "All right, so I gotta, I have to make a demo," um, and I've actually been wanting to do something like this for a very long time, and I've just sort of never had the reason or the opportunity to do it. It just kind of never got around to it. Uh, so I was really excited uh, to to sort of put together two really awesome things uh, that that I I had been learning about. Uh, so in this particular case, you know, uh, there was an API that came out with iOS 8 called SceneKit, which is a, a, a really nice and easy way of, uh, you know, doing 3D graphics on iOS. And then uh, using type providers, uh, in particular the CSV, right, because uh, if I wanted to make a city, and, and in fact that's, that's what we're going to show, we're actually going to uh, generate a 3D city. Uh, and in order to sort of place all these buildings, uh, you know, I kind of started kind of doing it line by line. I was like, all right, I'll put the first building here. I'll put. I'll oh, put uh, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, 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 I just noticed a bug in yeah. your code, in your oh. CSV code. Oh, where? Because you know what you're going to say is that it's, it's got a bunch of numbers yeah. and I read them in. But right. uh, you know, you left in you, you left in a header line, so uh, your parse is going to crash on that. Ah, but actually, it's not. See, because the the type provider, the type provider actually <laughs> uses that information. <laughs> uses the information in the file, right? So I have the CSV file uh, that, you know, a non-programmer can actually generate, uh, you know, in something like Microsoft Excel, something like that. Uh, and they can actually generate this file, give it to me, and they don't have to worry about, you know, installing Xamarin Studio and all this other stuff. Um, so the type provider actually looks into the file, uses the, the column headers, and actually inspects the data in, uh, uh, in every column uh, in order to give you a strongly typed interface. So to use this, I mean, it really could not be any simpler, just like Rachel said. Uh, it's one line up here. I define a type. I call it building. Uh, and I point it to the CSV file. This is what gives the, uh, the uh, type provider the information. Uh, and then, you know, over here I have some, some scene kit code to kind of build up the buildings and everything. And uh, over here in the load, all I got to do is uh, load the CSV file and then iterate over over every row in that collection. And you get this nice building.row, which is strongly typed. And you get things like width, length, height, uh, x and y position sort of in the world. Um, and, and they're decimals, so they're already ready to go. I don't have to do uh, any, any transformation. I don't have to do any parsing, anything like that. And... Uh, it just made it really easy. Uh, this actually took not a whole lot of time. I got I got I got the scene kit code up and running in one evening, and then I got the type provider code uh, up and running the next evening in like 30 minutes to an hour. Um, and what we end up with is a nice little building, uh, which which was really fun to work on. Okay, so um, back to the. Slides, I think. Did I? Did we miss yeah. anything yeah, here? Yeah, no, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, back to the slides. So, I I use this anecdote about the uh, Mars Surveyor to talk about the importance of compile time types, and I can go on at length about why I think uh, it's important. But there's a little bit more to the story. So it basically turns out that this anomaly had been noted from day one. Uh, not to going into it too deep, uh, it had been written by a new engineer. The teams were not co-located, so they didn't have that serendipitous communication. And the killer to me is that the source code had been in space before. It had flown successfully because that, soft, because that code was for a log file that was intended to be read by humans. And you know, hey, code reuse, that's, the, that's a great value. So what sounds like a story about compile time types and strong type is actually about people. And I started the talk with Jerry Weinberg's first law of consulting, which is that no matter what they tell you, there's a problem. 
Jerry Weinberg's second law of computing is that no matter how it looks at first, it's always a people problem. <laughs> you know, we can't, <laughs> yeah, can you, yeah, it's just, you can't see. So we can't wish away the human element. We can't formalize it away, and we shouldn't try to, because the flip side of it always being a people problem is that it's always a people triumph. You know, the techniques we use that help improve our productivity help us build the world in which we want to live faster. I mean, Joel was literally building the world in which he wants to live. <laughs> so if functional programming techniques are to succeed in the real world, and I think they will succeed in the real world, it's not because of the math. It's not because of category theory. It's not because of the syntax. It's because they're clearer, perhaps, more reliable, perhaps. They have fewer moving pieces, perhaps. But all of those perhaps depend upon you, the programmers. So by combining great tools with great processes, and above all, by respecting and empowering the people with whom we work, we can make our apps more awesome. And we can build the future in which we want to live. Uh, the best book that I know currently for C-sharp developers who are moving towards F-sharp is Dave Fancher's Book of F-sharp. Once you get a little more into F-sharp, expert F-sharp, and uh, F-sharp deep dives, I think, are essential. There's a fantastic blog by Scott Vlashen called F-sharp for Fun and Profit. Uh, he's threatening to put out a book, so you should all ping him. <laughs> I'd like to thank Joel Martinez, Florian Nussberger, who wrote the C-sharp uh, version of the shader Mandelbrot. And above all, I'd like to thank Dave Thomas. I don't work on F-sharp at Xamarin. He does. It's all his effort. And without Dave, uh, the F-sharp experience uh, with Xamarin would be, would be nothing compared to where it is. So big shout out to him. And I have to thank uh, our two gladiators, Ryan and Ed, who put up with us when we drunkenly said to them, hey, yeah, it'd be really a funny photo. <laughs> My name's Larry O'Brien. We've gone uh, over time, but, oh, and we've gone over time. So thank you very much. <laughs>